this morning as I was driving in early, all of a sudden I started singing this little song I haven't sung since I was like a little kid. And it was, my God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. And then I started getting really into it. I'm like, my God is so big. Just kidding. <laughs> but I did in the car. <laughs> so strong and so mighty. There's nothing. We don't need reverb today. But uh, <laughs> he's like, oh, he's really going to go for it. I better put some reverb on. Uh, <laughs> like, I keep him guessing around here. Um, and I just started singing that. My spirit started singing that. And I believe that this is a moment for us to awaken to the reality of the bigness of God, the largeness of God. And uh, we're going to be in 1 Samuel today, chapter 16, and mostly in chapter 17. And I just uh, I felt to share a few things from the life of David, and then I think we're going to have a really time of just praying at the end for people. But if you're not familiar with David in the Bible, I know most of you are if you've been in church for a while. David was this, this young man who became king of Israel, and he was chosen by God out of utter obscurity. He was this shepherd boy, the shepherd kid who came from these really humble beginnings. And he's this worshiper, this worship warrior um, king who God plucks up from a field where he tends his father's sheep and he anoints him to become king. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 16, um, we find this story where David comes on the scene and God speaks to the prophet Samuel to go to Bethlehem and find a guy named Jesse. And because God has chosen one of his sons, to be the next king. God has spoke that to Samuel. So the Lord told Samuel, once you get there, I'll let you know what to do. And I'll show you who the one is that you're going to anoint. How many know that um, oftentimes when God tells you something to do, he only gives you the first step? Have you experienced that? One step at a time. Do this, and then I'll tell you what's next. Do that, and then I'll tell you what's next. And so Samuel he, he obeys the Lord. He goes to this town and he arrives there and he tells the elders of the city that he's come to sacrifice to the Lord. They're a little worried that he's there. They maybe think the judgment of God is going to come. And, and so they're concerned. And he calms them down and just says, hey, we're going to have a worship service here. We're going to make a sacrifice to the Lord. And he invites Jesse and his sons to the sacrifice. Now, David was the youngest son of Jesse. He had eight sons. And he would have been the least likely and the least expected of his brothers for God to choose. And I can just imagine there, Jesse and his, his boys there at that worship service. And, you know, kind of like here, maybe Samuel's in the front row, kind of looking over the room like I was looking over y'all worshiping. It was beautiful. And he's kind of sizing, sizing these boys up a little bit. So Samuel, it says he goes one by one through the brothers, brother by brother, in search of who God has sent him there to anoint. And he, he, he comes to the first son, the oldest, the first son, his name's Eliab, and he, and he looks at him and he thinks, man, this guy looks like a king. He looks the part. And the Lord corrects Samuel, and he says to Samuel, don't look at his appearance, looks aren't everything. How many thankful looks aren't everything? <laughs> I am too. Don't be impressed by what he looks like on the outside. In fact, he says something really bold about the oldest son. He says, I've rejected him. He's not the one. Same as like, okay, next. Goes to the next boy, Abinadab. Nope, that's not the one. Shama, nope, that's not the one. And it says there that after seeing all seven of the brothers, Samuel tells Jesse, the Lord hasn't chosen any of these. And the prophet asked Jesse, um, is this it? Are these all your sons? Are they all here? And Jesse says, uh, well, there's actually one more son. He's out in the field taking care of the sheep. And the, the dad's like, you know, he's not here. We didn't even think to invite him, right? And, uh, 
the prophet Samuel says, go get him. And he's rather urgent about it. He says, go get him. He says, we're not even going to sit down until he comes. So they go get David from the field. And when David arrives, the Lord speaks to Samuel immediately when he gets there. And he says, this is the one. Anoint him. How many know that when it's the one, it's the one? How many know when it's not the one, it's not the one? How many know when the Lord speaks, he speaks? I was thinking about this. The Lord could have told Samuel, hey, when you get there, all the sons of of David aren't going to be there. The ones that are there that are lined up, they're actually not the ones. The ones that is the one is out in the field. So just go ahead and call for him. But he didn't. Sometimes I think we have to know what isn't before we know what is. That's a good word. Especially for those of you looking for a spouse. Or like those of us who are looking for a house. That rhymed, right? I'm so poetic. It's amazing. And in verse 13, it says that Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed David in the midst of his brothers. And the spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward. Can you say from that day forward? Thank you. You're excellent. And when I read that, I was just, I don't know what the commentaries say about it, but when I read from that day forward, I was like, what a picture of what was to come on the day of Pentecost, the spirit of the Lord upon a person from that day forward, walking with that. Have you ever noticed the pattern in scripture that God seems to regularly choose and use the least likely to accomplish his purposes? The one who doesn't fit the part. He uses weak things we know to confound the wise. He uses what doesn't make sense to confound what does in the eyes of man. Luke chapter one says this. It says he has set kings down from their thrones and lifts up the humble. This is exactly what he did with David when he anointed him. King Saul The backdrop for this is King Saul had turned his back from following the Lord because he had not obeyed the commandments of the Lord. And because of his disobedience, it says in 1 Samuel 13, 14, it says this, it says, the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart and the Lord has commanded him to be prince over his people. And I want us to remember today in this moment that we're in that this is still True, this is still the case that God does not look at the outward appearance of things. He doesn't look at the facades that we carry or the external qualifications. He looks at the heart. He's looking at the heart, straight to the heart. What's, what's pretty wild is that David actually doesn't become king for 15 years from the time that he was anointed. So David continues doing what he had already been doing and he goes back tending his father's sheep. There's so much in the life of David. It's like nugget after nugget after nugget of goodness. And I was thinking about this. Sometimes God calls you and anoints you for something and it takes quite a while before you actually step into the place that you've been called and anointed for. So David goes back and forth between shepherding the sheep And serving King Saul, see, King Saul, it says the spirit of the Lord left him and an evil spirit came over him because he'd rejected the Lord. And because of that, they were looking for uh, somebody that was anointed in music to come play over him to kind of calm the evil spirits down. I do that at home over my children sometimes. I'm just kidding. I don't. They don't have evil spirits. They're the best. Christy's going to get on to me. My kids are the best. They're wonderful. They They have no evil spirits. Okay. None. They're wonderful children. Wonderful kids. Now I'm overcompensating. (laughs) My kids are the best guys. They're so awesome. Uh, I'll use a different analogy next week or next service. Um, So anyways, the point is, is that he'd been called in to play his harp over King Saul um, when, when this oppression, this evil spirit would come over him, when he would play over him, the, the spirit would, would leave and he would have peace. And so David spent that next little season between serving King Saul by doing that and tending 
his father's sheep. So that's just a little bit of background um, of how David came on the scene. But I want to focus really the heart of this message today is out of the next chapter, chapter 17, where there is, you're familiar with it, there's this epic battle that's about to happen between the Philistines and Israel. And the Philistine army is gathered on one side of this hill and the Israelite army is gathered on the other side of the hill and there's this like valley in between them and they are about to battle. Now, if you grew up in church, you probably heard about this story from flannel graphs by your Sunday school teachers. I don't know that I've ever heard the message of David and Goliath preached here at Hope. I'm sure Pastor Gary did at some point, but I feel like there is something in this story today for us as a church. Um, I don't have a flannel graph. That would have been fun. I should have. But so there's this giant, we know his name's Goliath and he's nine foot something. So he's nearly 10 feet tall. Now that's a tall dude. I mean, that's, that's like, wait, that's a few feet taller than our tallest man in the church, Brad McCarter, right? Raise your hand, Brad, so everybody can see you. Um, and, and, and this Goliath, this tall man is taunting the Israelites and he's literally freaking them out. And, uh, they're about to go to war and this, this giant has this idea and he says, Hey, Let's not have the armies fight each other. I want to fight whoever's brave enough to fight me. And if I win, you all will become our slaves. And if you win, we'll become your slaves, right? So I imagine him like beating his chest like this manly man, right? The guy probably goes to all the local beast feasts, (laughs) right? I'm sure he does, right? He just, he probably, he looks like he would go there. And he's challenging the army of Israel to a fight. Now, um, I typically use the ESV uh, translation, but sometimes I like paraphrases like the message. And so this morning, I want to kind of read this story because it's a story out of the message. And we're going to start in verse 11. And it says this, when Saul and his troops heard the Philistines challenge, It says they were terrified and lost all hope. Can you say that with me? They were terrified and lost all hope. Verse 16. Each morning and evening for 40 days, Goliath took his stand and made his speech. This speech of who is going to fight me? Who's going to fight me? Can you imagine Every morning and every meaning f- evening for 40 days, this guy is out there like beating his chest and he's, he's scaring the bejeebers out of them. Starting the day, ending the day. Can you think about that? And it says this, the, the giant wears this big old bronze helmet on his head. He's got, it says like 126 pounds of armor on his body. Sword and spear are like as long as a fence rail. The spear tip, they say, alone weighed over 15 pounds, and he's screaming out, come out and fight! Come out and fight! It's like like this giant is doing psychological warfare every single morning and every single evening to terrify them to the point that they lose all hope. So David's three older brothers are in the army the ones that God didn't choose to be king. And they're experiencing all of this, this scenario. And one day, Jesse, the dad, tells David to go down to the camp where they're about to fight Goliath and the Philistines and to bring them some supplies of food to the brothers and to come back and then to let Jesse know how they're doing. And in verse 20, it says, David was up at the crack of dawn, And having arranged for someone to tend his flock, he took the food and was on his way just as Jesse had directed him. He arrived at the camp just as the army was moving into battle formation, shouting the war cry. Israel and the Philistines moved into position, facing each other, battle ready. David left his bundles of food in the care of a sentry, ran to the troops who were deployed and greeted his brothers. And it says, while they were talking, 
Together, the Philistine champion Goliath of Gath stepped out from the front lines of the Philistines and gave his usual challenge. And David heard him. Now, I don't know, as I was reading this, you guys, I was reminded of when I was 10 years old and I watched Rocky IV. Do you, does anybody watch Rocky IV? Rocky IV is, is the one where, where Rocky fights the, the Russian, right? The, the, the big Russian, Ivan Drago. Do you remember Ivan? Okay, some of you do this. You're like, I have no idea what you're talking about. I got to tell you this, as I read this, this came back to me instantly. I remembered being in the movie theater as a 10-year-old kid, and I remember the fear I felt when I saw Ivan Drago come out, and I thought, I thought, Rocky, you are getting squashed today. And I feel like that's sort of what it feels like as I read this today, and it says in verse 20, he comes out. Goliath taunting them, and it says the Israelites to a man fell back the moment they saw the giant totally frightened. The ESV says they fled. They fled at the sight of him. The talk among the troops was, have you ever seen anything like this? This man openly and defiantly challenging Israel. How many things have we said about the last year and a half? Have you ever seen anything like this? Have you ever seen anything like this? The man who kills the giants, this is what they say, will have it made. The king will give him a huge reward, offer his daughter as a bride, and give his entire family a free ride. That's fun. You get the girl, you get a cold million, and you don't have to pay taxes on it. That's, that's a good deal. That's what you get. Verse 26, David, who was talking to the man around him, asked, what's in it for the man who kills that Philistine and gets rid of this ugly bloat on Israel's honor? What does he think? He, who does he think he is anyway, this uncircumcised Philistine, taunting the armies? of God alive. Now think about this. This is what this is what's happening here. These guys are so impressed by Goliath, but David isn't impressed. David isn't impressed. Everybody else was. He was way more impressed with the the God of the angel armies armies than he was of the giants of the Philistines. He was way more impressed about who God was than this guy to the point where he says, "Who does he think he is anyways?" And you think about this, an entire army of God's people looked at Goliath in this morning and they saw an enemy that was too big to defeat. But David sees a moment that was too big to pass up. That should have been a bigger amen. I want to say that again. The entire army of God's people looked at Goliath and they saw an enemy that was too big to defeat, that was causing them to literally cower and run. But God sees a mo or David sees a moment that was too big to pass up. In verse 28, it says, Eliab, his older brother, heard David fraternizing with the men and lost his temper. What are you doing here? Why aren't you minding your own business, tending that scrawny flock of sheep? I know what you're up to. You've come down here to see the sights, hoping for a ringside seat at a bloody battle. What's he doing right here? He's judging his brother's motives. Think about this. In this moment, these two brothers, the real enemy is the giant Goliath. And here in this moment where David is going to have to choose whether he will be distracted by his brother that's trying to pick a fight or if he's going to remain focused on the real enemy. This is something I think for us to pay attention to right now. The enemy will oftentimes present another enemy that isn't the real enemy to get us distracted and off into another battle that we aren't supposed to be fighting. And so what happens is, is that we actually miss what we're called to. I want to say that again, often in the midst of moments like this, when an enemy comes, 
The enemy for us, the devil, he will often present a different enemy to try and get us distracted and off course so that we actually miss what we're called to be. To bring division among brothers, right? That's what's happening right here. Anything to get our focus off of what's really going on. Verse 29, David replies, what is it with you? (laughs) Sounds like a brother thing to say. All I did was ask a question. Get this, ignoring his brother, he turned to somebody else and asked the same question and he got the same answer as before. Sometimes you just have to ignore the distraction. Are you picking up what I'm putting down here? Sometimes you just have to ignore the distraction. What is David doing? David, he's asking multiple times about the battle because he's making sure that this is the battle that he's supposed to enter into. I just, I think this for us, just because somebody wants you to battle doesn't mean you should. Just because there's a giant in the land doesn't mean it's yours to deal with. Verse 31, the things David was saying were picked up and then reported to Saul. And Saul sent for him. Master, said David, he says this to the king, don't give up hope. I'm ready to go and fight the Philistines. Saul answered David, You can't go and fight this Philistine. You're too young, too inexperienced. And he's been at this fighting business since before you were born. So David said this, I've been a shepherd tending sheep for my father. Whenever a lion or a bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I'd go after it. I'd knock it down, I'd rescue the lamb, and if it turned on me, I'd grab it by the throat, wring its neck, and kill it. That's quite a resume he's given him, right? (laughs) Lion or bear, it made no difference. I feel like I need some organ music right now, right? Where's the organ music? Lion or bear, it made no difference. He says, I killed it, and I served it at the local beast feast. He said there's exotic meat there. It sounds like lion and bear. And this is what he says. He says, I'll do the same to this Philistine pig who is taunting the troops of God alive. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claw of the bear will deliver me from this Philistine. Listen to the courage of David that is there in him. And I think like at that moment, he started singing, my God is too big. My God is too mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big. My God is so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. I think we should just sing it for a minute. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty. There's nothing my God cannot do. I want to tell you, if you start singing that around your house, things will change. You start singing that instead of watching the news too much, things will change. You start singing that in your car on your way to work and you walk into your workplace with a whole different mindset. My God is so big. So strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. My God is so big, so strong and so mighty, there's nothing my God cannot do. God who delivered me from the teeth of the lion and the claw of the bear will deliver me from the Philistines. And this is Saul's response. Go and may God help you. (laughs) You got to love people that believe in you. God had been preparing David in the field. 
in the seemingly insignificant everyday life as a shepherd for this very moment. The battles that he's already fought and faced prepared him for the giant that stood before him. He had no idea that when he was fighting the bear, fighting the lion, that it was preparing him for this moment. And I just want to say this to us today. The battles and the enemies that you face along the way actually equip you to take spiritual ground. When we talk about enemies and giants, we're not talking about people. We're talking about the things that face you that are not right and illegal in the kingdom of God. No battle, no giant is insignificant. And I want to encourage you today, church, that God uses every single thing for our good. Do you believe that? Do you believe that whatever you are facing right now, that you have been prepared for that moment? You have been prepared for that moment. You are being equipped through every single difficulty that you face. And David knew that God was his protector. He knew him as deliverer because he had a history in God already. And he remembered his testimony of what God had done. So he's like, if the lion couldn't get me and the, and the bear couldn't kill me, if this giant opposes the purposes of God, it doesn't stand a chance. God delivered me then and God will deliver me now. And I feel like there is something in that for us right now, for us as a people in a church to remember what God has done and stand in this moment upon what he's done and say, God will do it again right now. God will do it again. What he has done, he will do. He will do. Verse 38, it says, Then Saul outfitted David as a soldier in armor. He put his bronze helmet on his head and belted his sword on him over the armor. David tried to walk, but he could hardly budge. David told Saul, I can't even move with all this stuff on me. I'm not used to this. And it says he took it all off. Saul wanted David to win, but he didn't understand the strategies of heaven. Hear this. Sometimes people want to try and put armor on you that doesn't fit. Sometimes well-meaning people that love God want, to, want you to fight in ways that you weren't meant to fight. To carry things that you weren't meant to carry. And sometimes there's going to be those who try and entice you to fight in the flesh a battle that can only be won in the spirit. And I want to say this to us today, that old strategies and weapons that don't fit won't work in a new season. Here's a word that will set you free, church. You can't wear the expectations of others as you step into your next assignment. You cannot wear the expectations of others. I've had to grow in this myself as we've stepped, I've stepped into different leadership over my life. I cannot wear the expectations of others as I step into my mission. David couldn't, and I want to declare it over you today, neither can you. The strategy that God gives you might not be the strategy that he's given somebody else. I'd never try and tell another pastor how they should pastor their church. I don't know what vision that God's given them. And neither should any of us. I don't know what he's called their church to do. I can only walk out his strategy for me and my, his strategy for us according to the word of the Lord. I just feel this for us. Guys, let's be a people who don't try and make other people wear our expectations for how they should walk out their mission. If you've been weighted down by other people's expectations and opinions, I want to tell you today is the day to lighten that load and to do like David did and take it all off. Take it all off. Keep your clothes on. Take off the armor. Take off that stuff that people are putting on you. I think that's freedom right there. That's freedom right there. Verse 40 says this, Then David took his shepherd's staff, selected five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the pocket of his shepherd's pack. And with his sling in his hand, it says he approached Goliath. Now church, I, I think there's really something on this for us. Whatever you are facing today, I want to tell you this. 
all that you need, you already have. Turn to your neighbor and tell him that. All that you need, you already have. You have everything you need. You have been given everything you need for life and for godliness, and you don't need somebody else's something. You don't need somebody else's something. What stands in front of you will be defeated with what he's already given you. The stones, the sling, what you need, you already have to slay the giant. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And it's the power of the Holy Spirit that lives in you. You might just have forgotten because you've been staring at the giant for too long. Here's what I want to tell you. When you stare at the giant week after week, morning after morning, noon and night, you feel like you don't have what you need. But I am here to tell you, you already have what you need to kill the giant. You already have what you need to kill the giant. You just have to pick it up. And I think the truth is that for most of us, our miracle the freedom or the, the breakthrough that, that our hearts long for or need begins when we stop being impressed with the size of the problem, with the size of the giant, with the size of the enemy. Charity can come and play anytime. Don't, I'm not done. Don't, don't get too excited. <laughs> Just need a little music here so I can sing and drive out the evil spirits. I'm joking, guys. I shouldn't joke so much. Verse 41 says this, as the Philistine paced back and forth, he noticed David. He took one look down on him and sneered, a mere youngster, apple-cheeked and peach-fuzzed. You don't find that in the ESV. <laughs> I love the imagination. The Philistine ridiculed David Am I a dog that you come after me with a stick? And he cursed him by his gods. Come on, said the Philistine. Get this, what he says. I'll make roadkill of you for the buzzards. I'll turn you into a tasty morsel for the field mice. <laughs> I know this sounds a little funny to hear it written like that, but I want to tell you, it's actually not funny because this kind of torment happens way too regularly to the sons and daughters of the living God. And here's what I want to suggest to you. We are empowered by our agreements because we become what we behold. We become what we behold. We're impacted by what we focus on and what we listen to and what we look at. And if for 40 days, listen to this, 40 days in a row, you were listening morning and night to the accuser and some giant that was breathing all kinds of threats and lies. I want to tell you, it's going to impact you. It's going to impact you. Because this is what giants try and do. They want to intimidate. They want to terrify you so that you lose all hope. Have you ever been there? This is how the enemy works. The enemy comes to try and threaten you, to kill you, to demoralize you. Say things like, you're not going to live, like you could never do what God is calling you to do. You could never survive this. You have no future. He'll lie about all kinds of things to cause you to be hopeless. But Jesus calls that the voice of the stranger. And for you and me, when an, when an enemy starts doing this stuff to us, we have to remember this. They are trespassing. They are trespassing because you have been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. You have been purchased with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Listen to this. 1 Corinthians 10.4 says this. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. And we destroy arguments in every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God. In the power of the Spirit. David answers, verse 45, he says, You come at me 
with sword and spear and battle axe. But I come at you in the name of the God of the angel armies, the God of Israel's troops whom you curse and you mock. And get this boldness. He says, this very day, come on church, say, this very day, declare it, this very day, God is handing you over to me and I'm about to kill you. Cut off your head. Serve up your body and the bodies of your Philistine buddies to the crows and the coyotes. The whole earth will know that there's an extraordinary God in Israel. And everyone gathered here will learn that God doesn't save by means of sword or spear, but the battle belongs to God. He's handing you to us on a platter. This is powerful. In the spirit, I believe that this is a declaration for us today. Not one to make us feel good for just a few moments or get hyped up in a church service, but actually a posture and a positioning centered around the power of God, the awareness of God, the greatness of God to declare over any work of darkness. I feel this for us, for every giant and every enemy that is trying to defeat you today. It is time for us to stand up and say, you come at me with all your torment and all your fear and all your cursing and all your mocking and all the stuff that's trying to make me lose hope. But I stand here today in the name of the Lord, our God, Jesus Christ, the resurrected one the God who defeated death, hell, and the grave, and who is ruling and reigning right now. And I am not going to fight with sword or spear. This battle is the Lord's. It belongs to the Lord. And we declare you're powerless, and I will not empower you today by my agreements. I will not set my eyes on the giants. I will fix my eyes on Jesus, and I will declare that God is big and the problem is small. You know how the story ends. Goliath tw comes towards David. David reaches in his pocket for a stone. He slings it. He hits Goliath in the forehead. And he crashed face down in the dirt. And it says this, then David ran up to the Philistine, stood over him, pulled the giant's sword from its sheath, and he finished the job by cutting off his head. It's pretty gruesome, right? When the Philistines saw that their great champion was dead, they scattered, running for their lives. Church, I want to tell you what an unbelievably beautiful picture of what Jesus did on the cross through his death and his resurrection. Come on. Boldness comes on those Israelites. And it says they rose with a shout and they chased off the rest of their enemies. And it said that David took the Philistines head back to Jerusalem and he took Goliath's weapons and he put them in his tent. Every battle leaves you with new weapons. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to declare over you that victory is the Lord's. How many would say in this place today, I am facing some giants. I am facing some real giants in my life. I want to just lift your hand. We're not glorifying it. I am facing some real giants. Okay. I want, I, I believe today the Lord wants to actually do some, some battle right now and deal with some things in a minute. I'm going to invite the minute. Well, actually ministry team, come on up here. But, um, you know, David was a worshiper. You can put your hands down. David was a worshiper and he wrote many of the Psalms in extremely difficult places of battle and assault. And in Psalm 34, he wrote this, this Psalm that says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And right now, what I want us to do is lift up our hands and we're just going to sing this little chorus and we're just going to bless the Lord for a few minutes. We're going to magnify the Lord together. Come on, just sing this out. Bless the Lord of my soul. Bless the Lord of my soul. Let all, all that's, that's 
hearts within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, let all that's within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, let all that's within me shout out, shout out. Okay. Now we're going to sing it like we just saw David cut the head of the giant off. And we're going to declare, bless the Lord, oh my soul, with all that's within me, shout out. Come on, church. We're gonna let that let that rise up, that declaration. Come on. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Let all this within Come me shout out. Come on, just declare that. Shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Let all this within me Come on. shout out. You're victorious in him. Shout declare. Out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's within me shout out, shout out, bless the Lord, oh my soul, and let all that's Declare within me shout out, freedom in this room today, out. freedom of the Lord, shout freedom out. of Jesus, bless the open it up for prayer in a minute and um, but I want to ask you before I do I want to ask you today what have you been impressed with what giant have you been impressed with have we been impressed with enemies or we have we been impressed with God I don't know how to say this other than this, that I think there's something so strategic right now for us in not being impressed with the size of our enemy, but being impressed with the size of our God. I want to say that again. I think there's something so strategic right now in not being impressed with the size of our enemy, but being impressed with the size of our God. And so this morning, I believe that the Lord is here to free people from addictions, from afflictions, from torment. I believe he's here to free people up from giants of trauma, giants of fear, giants of anxiety, giants of the fear of man, and giants of insecurity today. I believe giants are going down right now as we're gathered. Is there a witness in the house to this today? that by the Spirit of the Lord, they are going down. They're going down by the power and the presence of Jesus. For this was the Son of God manifest to destroy the works of darkness. Church, he is here today to destroy the works of darkness. And I, I believe today that there have been things that have been terrorizing sons and daughters of the living God that today they end. Today it's no more. And this isn't... A, this isn't about, I'm not trying to be hype on a Sunday morning. I actually believe it's, it's, it's the kingdom of God breaking in and freedom. 
And so this morning, it doesn't matter how big or how small, if you have been facing a giant, I want you to respond by just coming to the front of the room. And as we sing this in a minute, and you don't even have to find a ministry team person, you can just come and stand and say, I have been fighting a giant. And today I'm going to ask the Lord to fight this thing and break it off. I believe there are cycles of addiction going to be broken off today. I believe that cycles of trauma and fear are broken off. I also believe today that there have been cycles of dismay, which is the breakdown of your courage for what God has called you to do. Giants that have been trying to steal those things from you are breaking off today in this place. And so as we begin to sing this, I want to invite you to come and stand in the front. And at some point, a ministry team person is going to just lay their hand on you. And we're going to ask for the spirit of God to rush in on you and break that thing off in Jesus name, because I believe giants are going down. So if that is you, I encourage you to come right now as we sing this. Bless the and let all yeah. that's within me shine. Yeah, don't be afraid. Come on, just come and stand in the front. Bless Push in. The Lord, oh it's a day of freedom. Ministry team, just begin to move through. Lay your hands on people. Just come on. Press in. Shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Come on. Let all that's within freedom. me shout out. Jesus. Shout out. Bless the Lord, oh my soul. Let all that's within me shout out. Shout out, have your way, have your way, have your way. Yeah, just stand way. there, just receive from the Lord. A ministry team, pastors, staff, have your come on, way. just we'll lay our hands on Have you. your way, have your way, have your Freedom. way. stay right where you are in the front here. God is doing a work this morning. I believe there are more today. I specifically believe that God is breaking off cycles in the middle of the night. It's interesting that the terror by the giant came in the morning and at night, in the evening. I believe he's breaking off cycles of terror in the middle of the night this morning where there has been literal terror happening to you anxiety and fear 
breaking off, suicide breaking off, depression breaking off today. This is why Jesus was manifest, to destroy the works of darkness. And church, he is here this morning to do this. We're going to keep worshiping. And I want to encourage you, if you want some prayer, we're going to leave it open. If you need to go, you're free to go. But I'm telling you, today is a day. This is the day, this very day. People are going to leave here free. There are going to be people that have walked with things for years today, breaking off. I declare it in the name of Jesus. Sing that again.